I'm Jocelyn and my experience with voting, I think this is very important to share with teens or people who are like, are gonna vote for the first time. Like I was a non-voter really early in my youth, as soon as I was 18. I grew up with a very punk rock like upbringing, ideology. So I thought that I didn't like, this changes really didn't affect me until right, I started to educate myself. I started to learn more about policies and what that entails. And perhaps I didn't see like these, uh, like laws really, really being reflected or be really making a change in my life, but I saw how they were affecting my community. So I think that's where I really had that shift. And I think it's important for us to acknowledge that, right? That sometimes these laws really don't affect us or the, the people in power affect us directly, but they do affect like people in the larger masses, right? So it might not affect me, but it might be, affect somebody in like my relative. Before you know, we often think of California as this blue progressive state um, where the bellwether for the nation. So what policies, you know, get passed in California are later passed right and across the nation. But just in 1994, only small pockets were progressive or blue. And then now in 2016, there's larger swaths that are. But it doesn't make us complacent. In fact, we know we need to work harder. We got to let people who are infrequent voters, uh, new voters who might not know the system, and people who just don't feel like change is possible, right? They've they kind of resigned to the fact that their voices don't matter. It's to reignite them and let them know, actually know um, their voices do, and voting is one concrete way in which they can make a huge impact. Prop 15 addresses Prop 13. This is where like the numbers get kind of confusing and you know the politics of this I think makes it difficult for people to participate. So here I'm trying to demystify it and explain it. So Prop 13 was really based on a legacy of racism but it was passed way back in 1978. So Prop 13 has to do with property taxes, property ownership, and the state. So property taxes, if you know, if you own a home, you pay property taxes, and that goes to support the state. It's supposed to support schools, goes to support communities, uh, social services, like clean water, um, parks, libraries, all that is, you know, government funding, right? So Prop 13 was passed in 1978. It would change how property taxes were assessed. But first, we have to think about what California was like in 1978. And even then, that was before I was born. But can you imagine that community college was free or really low cost in California? So we had an excellent public you know, education system. It was one of the best public schools in the, in the country. California had an extensive public school system from K to 12, and then community college and as well as the UCs, right? But a lot of that was uh, free or really low cost. And the property taxes were things that were, were the way that we kept those system, you know, high quality. And the property taxes, of course, were paid by homeowners. And so who were the homeowners in 1978? Well, it has to go back to who had access to loans so that they could afford the homes, right? If you remember the video from last week, they talked a little about redlining, the policy of redlining and home ownership. So home ownership is tied to wealth. If you can buy a home and put money into your home, then you can build wealth. And you can use the money from the home as collateral to buy a car, to pay for your kid's education. So the reason that there's a great disparity between, let's say, black wealth and white wealth is that white homeowners had access to these loans that the federal government provided through taxpayer dollars in 1930s um, as part of the New Deal. So that, you know, to create affordable housing, you can get a loan, buy a house. But there were neighborhoods that were redlined, right? So these were neighborhoods where African Americans, Black communities lived, and they did not get these loans. So they did not have access to these loans. So while one group could buy a home and establish wealth, one group could not. And this was a state-sanctioned policy that led to uh, segregation. Another part, on top of the redlining policies, there were racially restrictive covenants. So there were limitations like you know, who could occupy, lease, or own a certain set of property, and you could discriminate racially based on that. So again, access to certain housing, access to certain neighborhoods were limited to communities of color. The sign in itself, we want white tenants in our community shows that. And then another government policy, the GI Bill. Really great bill, right? So after World War II, veterans can come back, get access to higher education, 
for free or low cost. They built hospitals and for veterans, you could also have low interest um, home loans. So you can build wealth. But Black Americans, Black veterans were also discriminated against. They were not honorably discharged like their white counterparts and could not access these loans. So here you see how government policies set this wealth divide. As a response to, you know, the inequality, so this came, you know, from the 1930s to 19, mid-1960s, um, and that's when we have the civil rights movement, right, 1955, 19, to the 1970s, where they demanded uh, no more discrimination, right, it was enough. And so you had, you know, the Immigration Act of 1965, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, Fair Housing um, Act, where you could not discriminate in the ways that were legally sanctioned before. And there was integration of schools, right? No, the segregation, you can't just keep communities segregated. That was not right. You have integration. Um, but in the 60s and 70s, there was a, a, a white lash or a backlash against the civil rights movement. Here in this photograph um, is a, a photo of moms, parents, and kids protesting against integration. Can I get one or two people to read one or two of the signs, or one person to read two of the signs out loud? Um, one of them says, spend money for education, not buses. And another right. says, uh, no forced busing. Um, yeah, that's all I can remember. Great. So the language here is not saying, they don't say we don't want integration. They're using different language to say that. So they're using, oh, it's not about, um, it's about forced busing. It's not about integration, right? It's about um, voluntary, but no, only voluntary busing. It's about choice. It's about what it has, other words, freedom, right? So using these neutral words that people can relate to, but underneath is the sentiment of really uh, racial animus. The real reason is they don't want to have integration. So there's a backlash against the civil rights movement about affording rights to others, about giving up some of that, uh, what their people or communities are accustomed to or used to, about um, you know, not having, sharing um, the resources. So within this backlash came Prop 13. Again, this, this proposition that was uh, widely passed in 1978, and it was called a taxpayer's revolt. So, I mean, at the same time, there was sentiment um, that, oh, there was fear, anxiety by homeowners who thought, oh, okay, I, I, I'm not sure how I'm going to pay my property taxes. Well, property values go up, then the property taxes um, go up. So there was some anxiety with that, but it was also tied to um, this, this racist fear. Um, also happening in the 70s was a court case that passed that made sure that all school districts, they had to share the funding. So if you think back to the map of the redlining, if you lived in a school district that was not redlined, your property values were up, then your school had good funding so that students could thrive. Teachers had enough books, resources, small classroom sizes. Next door, can you imagine in a red line neighborhood, um, not high property values, uh, not enough taxes, so the schools are struggling. So this court case in 1971 made that illegal. They said that was not right. So you had to share um, the school district resources. That was also part of this, um, this white lash, right? This anxiety, this um, desire not to share the resources where, um, you know, neighborhoods only wanted funds to support their communities. Let's see, before I go on, are there any questions, clarifying items? Okay, you can always drop it into the chat. So, Again, it was passed in 1978 with a lot of support, and it was called a wolf in sheep's clothing. So using this language around um, homeowners, protecting homeowners, it really led to um, anti, a strong anti-government sentiment and the gutting of the state. So these are some of the consequences that we still experience today. There's a fundamental shift in, in um, how California state um, revenue was uh, created and now actually gutted. So now, you, I mean, I'm sure in the news every year we hear about more budget cuts, right? Cuts to public health. That's been very big part of why we're having a lot of trouble dealing with the coronavirus pandemic. Um, and then increased 
in uh, what the working class communities pay. There's the nickeling diming and like, you know, sales tax increase that's pro disproportionately felt by working class communities. Bonds, so borrowing for the future to pay for schools. Um, community college fees go up every year. Tickets, parking tickets, those little things are the way that the state has to make up the lost revenue. Because what happened is property taxes um, with Prop 13 were set so when until you change ownership so if you bought your home in 1978 prop 13 passed it kept those property taxes at the 1974 values until the next person buys your home and then the next person has to pay according to when they purchased it but the real winners behind this that is not often mentioned under the skies of protecting homeowners were large corporations so we talked before about how large corporations um, have a lot of power in this country, right, and in the state and in politics, um, but they also benefited because it also applied to their property. So you can imagine these profitable, um, well-established old companies that bought land before 1978 are only paying the property taxes at that time. So wealthy corporations and white homeowners were the drivers of this bill. So now this year we have called, we recall we gathered 1.7 1.7 million signatures to put Prop 15 on the ballot. And what Prop 15 would do is um, have corporations pay their fair share. So you'll see a company like IBM, it only pays 50 cents per square foot, but it should be paying $200 per square foot. All that money would go towards, you know, state, local communities, again, parks, library, clean water. And a recent study showed that only 10% of the wealthiest 92% of the revenue. So 10%, this, and it would tax uh, the corporations. So the homeowners are protected. Um, the corporations are the ones that would, would pay. And small businesses would get a tax cut and um, uh, properties under 3 million are not part of, would not get reassessed. So again, it shows the shift from homeowners um, from 1978, from corporations to, uh, to homeowners who pay a uh, majority of the taxes. So this is the impact, right? These are things that we deal with and we see you know, every day, right? We have crumbling infrastructure and pipeline, we have environmental racism, over-policing, uh, lack of health care, homelessness, when there is investment or opportunity in our communities, this is what happens. And we deal with it, um, you know, every day. I just want to leave with this quote, and I'll go back to that previous slide, but I want to quote um, an author that I'm a fan of, Ursula Gwynn. And sometimes, you know, we can't see past the reality that we know, but she asks us to, you know, think back to our imagination. So she says, we live in capitalism. Its power seems inescapable. So did the divine right of kings. And any human power can be resisted and changed by human beings. Again, in art, and very often in art, the art of words. So I think you'll be focusing on lettering today. So I encourage you to think of words um, kind of beyond can hearken to or help people think about ways they have power. So any questions, comments, clarifications, disagreements, I'm open. Reactions. Can I get just at least two reactions, brave souls? So just like, was this really new? Was this um, not very, relevant <laughs> like what how do you what are you what are you thinking about all this information that i shared is it you know like oh homeowners that's not me like you know these are all things that would be helpful for us because we really want we see that this as some has fundamentally fundamentally shifted how california as a state has been in terms of giving more power to corporations and taking away investments for so we want to undo that I mean, what you're, oh, go ahead. what you're explaining, it does make a lot of sense with regards to the state of our state. Yeah, so you see a lot of the impact. 
right? Yeah, and I understand a lot of the complaint mm -hmm. about California. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is the context to what it was. And then I see Sophia put in the chat, didn't know a lot about Muko, very interesting. Thank you, Sophia. I see also, it's very new. Great. Okay, so touched upon the topics, but really kind of putting it together. Thank you again, Sophia. Great, thank you. So I'll stop my screen share and pass it back to you, Justin. Thank you, thank you. All right, so now that we have all that information, right, a lot of it's probably till, still testing, right? So I think this is like something really beautiful that happened when we were giving a lot of information, like one way to process it is to make art about it, right? So that's really neat and that's what we're gonna do today. Okay, so I also have a very quick- um, Register to vote. So, you know, you have to register in order to vote. Um, uh, there is, um, for folks who are interested in November, there is a, a ballot proposition to lower the voting age. So um, I'll talk more about the ballot propositions um, towards the end. But um, the deadline is October 19th. So graphics that share October 19th, you know, as the date or the website. Um, there's also, uh, oh, James Baldwin, I love that. I just saw that in the chat. I love how he writes with such clarity. Um, okay, so also there is, um, people should know that if you miss the deadline, it's okay. You can register to vote on the same day um, at a vote center or polling place. And then we're trying to promote September 22nd as the National Voter Registration Day. So any graphics that highlight those bullets um, would be awesome. Voting by mail. So now because of COVID-19, um, we worked with the California legislature and a broad array of organizations, uh, labor, environmental, women's um, health organizations to make sure that uh, people have the access to the vote. So because of that activism, we were able to pass um, laws that for this election will give every registered and active voter in California a ballot in the mail so they can vote by mail. So one thing we're really asking folks to do is to confirm the registration. Um, this graphic is from the California Endowment, their major funder, you know, so there's a lot of electoral arts, you know, um, going on. So I'm, and throughout the presentation, I'm giving you little snippets to kind of give you ideas. Um, but that's the website to confirm your voter registration. What we're concerned about is with COVID-19, there might be a movement with people. And um, historically, there's a pattern of even when voters vote, every election we've seen it in our own staff of black voters who have been taken off the rolls so we don't want that disenfranchisement to happen we don't want people to be caught off guard so we're letting them know confirm your registration and make sure you receive your ballot um ballots drop on october 5th so another graphics to let people know like okay this is if you don't get it you know within the first two weeks of october like you know you should, like something is amiss and then the state has also created this where's my ballot sos.ca.gov so you can track it that will give people i think a lot of assurance that you know their vote will count and they can track it and i've actually used that in past elections and it's really nice because i usually vote by mail and i mail it in so you know sometimes i'm concerned like did it count did it get it and it'll tell you when it was accepted um and you know what i'm going to share this with you so you don't have to ask so you have these in your notes i'll drop it in the chat as well you can take notes or whatnot um so return your ballot there's lots of ways to vote by mail um, you can, of course, return it in the mail, no postage necessary. There's been a lot of news and concern, and I think um, a lot of fear that's been instilled and distrust for political purposes um, with the U.S. Postal Service, right? That is real, um, but also kind of um, I, for political purposes, like I said. So um, you don't have to just mail it in. You can drop it off at a ballot drop box. Um, the state is still figuring out locations for that, but there's mandated like per every 1,000 voters, you know, there should be, you know, a ballot drop box. Or you can return it at a link place or vote center, so you don't have to wait in line. Theoretically, right, you should just be able to drop it off. Um, or you can vote safely in person at a polling place or a vote center. 
Um, so to the right is this piece by Fabiana Rodriguez. She's one of the founders of a group called Culture Strike. So they do amazing um, political art. Um, and then to the left is this graphic that I put together, but I would invite you all to make something that's more like um, less informational, but more uh, what to the people and inspiring. But I think if we have, you know, we're trying to get the same information in multiple ways because people need to see it more than once in order for it to stick. Okay, third, vote centers and polling places. Um, this is um, an artist that we're working with. Um, there, we're also, the state is also looking for a poll center. I don't know if you saw the news that uh, uh, LeBron and the NBA, they're trying to get folks to, uh, you know, volunteer or, or be um, poll workers. But at any uh, vote center, you can do same day voter registration. And in some counties, you can avoid lines by voting early in a vote center. So some counties will open four days before the election. Some counties will open 10 days before the election. Um, I have a list of the counties. If you want to ask me, I can tell you it's hard because we're a statewide organization. We want to provide information, but each county, like how um, it's administered bureaucratically, sets their own, the registrar sets their own voting rules. <laughs> so it's a little bit hard to give like uh, the same information. It's not all the same throughout California, but there should be early voting available. And then the vote center Centers, we want people to know that they're safe. They're you know, meant to be big spaces where people can physically distance. And if anyone wants, if, any, if I could fast or anyone has any questions, um, please feel to drop it into the chat. Actually pause now to see if there's any questions. Okay, so I'll keep going. Voting early, like I mentioned before. Oops, I, this is the... I put in the voter registration day and can disregard that. Oops, let um, me go back. But the voting early day is October 24th. So we're trying to encourage folks to um, drop it off or mail in your ballot by that date. Um, there, because of the concerns with the US Postal Service, um, we won't want people to wait too late. In California, there's a law, law you just needs, it just needs to be postmarked by election day, which is November 3rd this year. And then there's 20 days until the um, post office has to receive it in order for the uh, ballot to count. That um, is better than most states. So it kind of allows for any delays in the mail, but you know, just to be safe and not to um, continue the message of fear, we're just trying to say October 24th is an early voting day. If you have any inspirational quotes or ideas or drawings from throughout um, you know, our time together about voting early. It'd be, be great to see pieces on that. And then, like I mentioned, the local county registrars where you would check to see um, where, when you can vote early in your county. So people would have to contact that. And as we get closer to election, there'll be more information. Um, stuff that were, that would also be great to see for media, for graphic content would be, um, you know, inspirational voting slogans. So I put a bunch here. You've already seen um, these in one of your sessions. Um, I put some quotes by voting, about voting that you can use um, if you like to do lettering or whatnot. And I put this one um, by Angela Davis that was shared recently with our anchor organization, um, Inner City Struggle says, I don't see this election as being about choosing a candidate who will be able to lead us in the right direction. It will be about choosing a candidate who can most effectively um, pressure, be pressured, be most effectively pressured into allowing more space for evolving anti-racist racist movement. So I think it, um, you know, speaks to a lot of how uh, communities feel about voting isn't the only way, but it's a strategic um, way to intervene at this point and to not do so is leaving your power on the table. Okay, and then election day. So election day is November 3rd, 2020. We encourage people to make a vote plan. So um, there's a lot of stuff on the ballot, a lot. Um, so just to vote beyond you know, to vote down ballot beyond just the presidential the election, the top ticket, but all the way, you know, locally. Um, so November 3rd is the deadline to vote in person, to drop the ballot in the drop box or to vote or to have the vote by mail postmarked. And then also it'd be great, you know, with um, 
you know, historically, uh, and we saw this in March as well, um, you know, long lines, different ways of um, voter disenfranchisement happen every election. And so um, to have a graphic that we can share maybe on election day, you know, for people to vote like, oh, if you're a polling center, you see this is happening, it's not supposed to be happening, they can call this number, this election hotline by this uh, nonpartisan um, uh, organization that will be monitoring it. 